under the heart of central London. This team of technicians is getting ready to undertake a critical test. I'll be up as soon as I can. They plan to power up for the very first time the biggest station on the brand new Elizabeth Line Railway that is being built beneath the city. This is an enormous milestone and a huge amount of work has gone into making this happen. With the £15 billion railway already behind schedule, they need this test to run without a hitch. Switching now. Three, two, one. Over the last nine years, an army of more than 10,000 workers has been under pressure to finish building this new railway. It's one of the most ambitious engineering projects in Britain since the time of Brunel. In the previous series, we followed workers excavate the railway's tunnels, install the tracks, and build its trains. This episode, with mounting construction delays having postponed the railway's launch by almost a year to autumn 2019. We don't need these problems right now. We follow the teams working on borrowed time to complete its next phase. We've got an incredibly tight deadline to work to. Fitting out the stations. If you damage a listed building, it could be up to a prison sentence. Powering up the line. Hey! No power, no trains, nothing. And testing the trains underground. It's an absolute intense battle to get this over the line. Oh, oh my God. This is the exclusive next chapter down, yeah. of the race to build London's new underground railway. Tottenham Court Road, the gateway to London's bustling shopping and theatre district, and the site of the most complex station being built for the city's new underground railway, the Elizabeth Line, formerly known as Crossrail. Hi, Simon. Hi, Lee Ling. How are you doing? Really good to see you. Good Thank see you for coming too. round. How's it going? The Elizabeth Line is the biggest construction project in Europe, and London's first new underground railway for 20 years. We've got the last 5% of install to be done, and that's really complicated. Yeah. Nice and steady, inches at a time, please, mate. But after nine years of construction, the project is in trouble. Just 14 weeks before passenger services were due to begin in December 2018, its engineers were forced to postpone the line's opening by almost a year. Look at that. This is really, really very close to being finished. It's been very nearly finished for a very long time. Delays in constructing the railway's stations okay. and installing the signalling and power have pushed the final fit out of the ticket halls oh. and the testing of the trains months behind schedule. They've departed and worked for them. And more than £600 million over budget. Welcome to our westbound. With the new opening deadline now set for autumn 2019, Crossrail CEO Simon Wright faces an ambitious challenge to get Britain's embattled flagship engineering project back on track to prevent further delays and limit costs from spiralling out of control. You can imagine we've been working extremely hard 24-7, literally, to reach that opening date, and so it was, you know, enormous disappointment. Sort of leaks. We do have a leak. The delay was caused by several factors. We've had delays finishing off the stations with mechanical and electrical systems. These are ridiculously complicated, aren't they? Oh, yes. We were trying to test with incomplete infrastructure. We ultimately found that there was not sufficient time left to do all the testing of the trains to prove that it was safe and that the trains would also be reliable. We've got to deliver and regain that trust and regain those reputations that were so hard won 
over so many years. To hit their new opening deadline, workers urgently need to complete fitting out the railway. This involves installing the signalling systems, lighting, platform cladding, escalators and signage so that technicians can finish testing the trains at high speeds along the full 120 kilometer length of the railway. A single day of additional delay could add up to around three million pounds to the cost of the project. Tottenham Court Road is one of the 10 new stations where construction work should already have been finished. Crossrail engineers are working flat out to install one critical element to prepare it for passenger services. Power. The big challenge now facing engineers is to plug everything in and switch it on. Put the terminations into the assets there. Project manager Li Ling Hai leads construction and fit out at this station. When the public come into a station, they probably don't think about everything it took to make sure that that station operates properly. They don't notice any of the mechanical and electrical systems. For example, that the lights are on, that the escalators are running. We don't expect them to see the work that goes on, but all that work is incredibly important. It will take approximately 160 megawatts of electricity to run the new Elizabeth line and its stations. Tottenham Court Road station requires a lot of power to run. It's about the same amount of power that you would provide to about six to 8,000 homes. The first electrified London Underground line opened in 1890. The railway stretched five kilometers and linked South London to the city. To wire the line up, workers had to pull copper cables through the train tunnels by hand and plug them into a huge generating station. Incredibly, the same strenuous technique is still used today to connect up the even bigger and more complex stations on the Elizabeth line. Tottenham Court Road station has more than 100 kilometers of cable and each one of those cables need to be fed by hand. No cables, no equipment, no station. Li Ling's team need to thread an intricate network of more than 100 kilometers of cable inside the new Tottenham Court Road station. These will power everything from ticket machines and gates to the lifts and escalators. But with the station almost built, Pulling so many cables through this labyrinth of walls, tunnels and ceiling cavities will be a challenging feat. The longest and heaviest of all the cables is the main power supply line. This vital artery powers the station's ventilation systems. Engineers must weave this two-ton cable by hand, right through the station, down through three floors, and into the main switchboard room where it will need plugging in. The slightest snag or kink in the cable could sever one of its wires and trigger even more delays to the railway's opening. Cable pulling can be really physical because while some cables are very thin and the size of your boot lace, other cables are huge fat cables that require large amounts of physical labor. I'll manage it, as that scaffold going? It rests on the shoulders of East End electrician Sean Thompson to wrangle this heavy hauling feat. When we get down to minus four, I'll have a look. I've been an electrician for 22 years now. From when I was young, I remember my mum was still just, if, you, if you've got a trade behind you, you're always going to have a job, really. Sean's been working on Crossrail for more than four years. Crossrail is second to none. We worked on Heathrow Terminal 2. That was similar, but... No, nothing like this. Today, we're pulling in the biggest and heaviest cable that we're using on this project. These one of the longest runs. It's about 93 metres, which might not sound that long, but it's the complexity of the run and all that means it's, it's not the easiest to do. It's 18 kilograms every metre, so not easy to shift. Hauling this two-tonne cable over the distance a sprinter would race 
will take some Olympian strength. We've got five boys in the day from Hartlepool. They're all big and strong. I think they breed them big there. One of them, so he's the size of a door. Most cable pullers are from Hartlepool, yeah. yeah. We don't use cable pullers from London because they're all soft. <laughs> Morning, lads. It's a 185 we're pulling in today, so it's going to be challenging. It's a very important cable, lads, so can't have any nicks on it or nothing like that. I really don't want to be taking this one back out again, and neither do you. Sean's team will need more than brute strength to guide this heavy-duty 93-metre-long cable through the maze of walls, cavities and shafts that lie ahead. Oh, cool, Their secret weapon? This steel guide sock that grips the front end of the cable so they don't lose it in the walls. Best description of it is like a Chinese finger trap. The harder you pull, the more it contracts on that cable so it won't ever come off. The team position themselves evenly along the length of the cable and call a unique chant to help pull in unison. It's a cable puller's call. We call it a mating call. They all have to pull in unison. He pulls out, they all know it for exactly the same time. If you pull at the wrong time, people have done banks in and all that. It's very important what they do. The actual call itself, I don't think they've changed it since they started pulling cables way back in Victorian times. With the cable just six metres into the 93 metre pull, they hit a snag. It looks like the cable's got stuck in the corner. Just too tight up there. Just fingers crossed now, getting it around this corner. A metal bar is blocking the path of the cable. You're pulling against this bar all the time. That was like a break. It's a challenging place, but some places it opens up and it's easier. What good there? They move the metal bar out of the way and heave again. But it's not long before they hit the next pinch point, a three-storey tall shaft that leads directly into the switch room. That's not coming down, that man. It looks good on paper. Then when you try and put some big cables to it, obviously it doesn't work. You have a nightmare. Uh, the cables got stuck again, and I think the lads are getting quite frustrated about it now. Two stops west. The countdown clock is ticking for workers to finish one of the most ambitious new stations on this section of the line. It will allow Elizabeth Line trains to plug directly into Isambard Kingdom Brunel's iconic Victorian terminus at Paddington. 35 million passengers use this station every year to connect to mainline underground and airport trains. Six years ago, the new station here was little more than a hole in the ground held open by 1,000 ton steel supports. Today, its ticket hall is lined with ornate bricks and a new additional entrance has been built to welcome its 70,000 passengers a day. Once complete, this will be the most significant transformation to Paddington for over a century. So if you sign up from 72 to 64, 28-year-old site manager Cynthia Mindhart is under pressure to prevent any further delays and complete the station's decorative roof canopy. I think Paddington's going to be one of the iconic stations. It's one of the biggest projects I've worked on. There's a number of challenges. One that's obviously a central London 
um, site and we've got sort of live roads all around us. Buildings that are occupied, a live station next to us. So logistics is a big challenge here. The construction work here is causing huge disruptions for local businesses, with a year-long delay to the line's completion set to cause even more misery. The problem is all the main entrance of the station has been closed. Many people cannot uh, come in and visit us because it's a long walk. We had to find different ways to survive. We start serving breakfasts in order to pay the bills and to pay our staff. Otherwise, we just go bust and that's it, finish. But hopefully when this thing is uh, concluded, maybe we have more customers. We've got businesses around us to keep happy. We've got a lot of work ahead of us to get it all complete. To end disruption and finish the new station here, Cynthia's team must now top out the construction with a great glass canopy. It will stretch 120 meters long and 18 meters wide. 340 tons of prefabricated stainless steel columns and beams make up the canopy structure. 220 one-ton panes of triple glazed glass slot inside the frames. These will allow light to flow uninterrupted right down to the platform level. To make the construction work even tougher, workers must erect this 4,000-piece steel structure just four inches away from Macmillan House, a Grade 1 listed building. A single scratch or knock could incur heavy penalties on the team. If you damage a listed building, it could be up to a prison sentence, so <laughs> we don't want any damage <laughs> to the building next to us. This is the most constricted site I've been on. We all know why we're here today. The first column's been installed for the canopy. When the loads are coming over, don't want anyone anywhere near it. You know, don't go underneath it, get well out of the way until it's safely in the hole. Jib down a bit more for me, please, Leighton. When you're lifting, you think everything can go wrong. You're only as good as your last lift, because your next lift could be an accident, near miss, fatal. So if you think of the worst, you count for everything. Walk nice and slow, please, mate. Are you ready up on top? I'm ready, yeah. It's on its way to you. The crane operator and ground team must remain focused. Any lapse in concentration and the column could hit passing traffic or crash into scaffolding, taking the entire deck with it. Slew round to your left a bit so Flon can get that tagline, please. Lovely, the tagline is from you now. Keep coming to the left. Keep it coming. Keep coming down. Nice and clear. Keep coming down as you are. Nice and slow. Keep coming nice and slow as you are, mate. We've got about uh, four inches. Down a bit more. And stop. Accident lift Leighton. You got it on lifting like that, mean you're gonna fall in love. And up you go. Nice and easy, mate. Keep going up. Keep coming, buddy. Just keep coming down nice and easy. Scaffolding everywhere down here. And a bit more. All stop, all stop. Now they have the first six columns in place. Swinging in this 22-metre-long rafter will take nerves of steel. Installing the rafter up against Macmillan House, we have about four inches, roughly. It's a tricky installation. OK, Leighton. Nice and slow for me, mate. Oh, well. Let's just hope it fits. 
Nice and easy. Nice and easy, man. Oh my gosh, it's close. Oh. Yeah, pretty tight. It's in. The raft is looking good now for welding, so should be good to tack it in place. He went very well. Fabulous crane driver up there. And he has what I call touch of an angel. Everyone's got a bit of a sense of relief now that the first uh, raft is in. Now just another 20 more rafters to go. With 130 more tons of steelwork and the glass roof to install, Cynthia's team must work around the clock to stand a fighting chance of completing the canopy in time for the railway to open. One stop east is Bond Street, London's luxury quarter. This playground for the rich and famous is home to Europe's most expensive shopping street, attracting 200 million visitors each year. The new station here will be a vital gateway to the area, expecting over 130,000 passengers every day. Work began on this site in 2010. Engineers excavated 302,000 tons of earth to make space for the underground station and poured 100,000 tons of concrete to line the walls for its ticket halls. Today, most of the flooring, wall cladding and lighting may be installed. But construction work here is running up to six months behind schedule. And there's one crucial piece of machinery that's still missing. The station's escalators. Ollie Megan, call back. Ollie. 30-year-old Australian engineer Tim Wean. Thank you is supervising the installation of three huge escalators into this station to connect the entrance at road level down to the platforms. Spanning 65 metres, these escalators will be the longest on the Elizabeth Line. It's mind-blowing, the size and scale of the project. I guess because of the size, it, it brings up a lot of challenges. I've always sort of had a passion for engineering construction, even since I was a little kid playing with Lego and and stand in the backyard. So to be here, a little bit of a dream come true, really. It's Europe's largest infrastructure project, and it's great to be a part of it. The escalators are an essential tool to maintain the steady flow of people through stations. The first escalator on the London Underground opened in 1911 at Earls Court Station. It was made of wood and powered by an electric motor. The novel contraption attracted 18,000 people eager to try it out on its first day. Even though dresses were torn and fingers pinched, it proved an instant success. Thousands of people will be using these escalators every day. Without the escalators, there'd be no station. The three escalators at Bond Street will connect the eastern ticket hall at street level to the train platforms 28 metres underground. Installing them will be a formidable challenge. Each escalator is 65 metres long. Too long to slide into place in a single piece without hitting the ticket hall roof. So Tim's team plan to separate each escalator into 13 pieces. The smallest section will be five metres long, but still weigh two tonnes. The team must carefully winch each section down a 30-degree angle incline, lined with steps on a set of tracks like a roller coaster. It will take great skill and coordination to control these unwieldy pieces of metal 
as they lower them down this passageway into place. So one of the biggest challenges we've got here at Bond Street is getting the escalators to site. They're trucked from the factory through the heart of London and they need to arrive on time, ready for us to install. Tim's work site is hemmed in by luxury apartments and boutique businesses. Yeah, keep going. It's taken the team nine months to plan the complex logistics of this operation. But the constant stream of monster deliveries like this is a relentless nightmare for this area's discerning residents. The day-to-day -day problems are um, lorries coming along and closing the road off, stopping parking outside, like just the dust and like the pollution from it all, the noise. Hello? Obviously, that kind of disruption is like not cool if you're trying to do someone's hair and they're trying to relax. What are we doing? A lot of work goes on behind the scenes to ensure we're minimising any disruptions to our neighbours. So this goes in the building first. Huge moment for the team to see the first escalator arrive. It's all systems go now. They're on wheels, but they're still seven plus tons, so they are movable, but. They're very heavy and it takes a lot of guys to manoeuvre them. A full escalator is 13 truss units and then we can fit 12 in this ticket hall uh, at any one time due to the space. If there is a glitch and uh, we're not installing at the rate we need to, we'll have to turn the trusses away, uh, which will ultimately delay station opening. So, mammoth task ahead of us. The first section is generally the hardest because A, it's the heaviest, and B, it's got the longest distance to travel, so that one section needs to travel from top to bottom, and once that section's in, the rest should just fall into place. That's a rocket. Yeah. All right. You all right boys? Yeah, all clear. Out you go. Right, you ready? This winch cable is all that stops the first seven-ton escalator section from sliding out of control as they attempt to abseil it over the edge and down the steep incline of steps. It's a heavy piece of gear. There's a lot of weight on it. Just as they get going, the wheels jam in the tracks. The guys have to make sure the wheels are straight and uh, sort of jostle the wheels into position to make sure they're running straight down the track. Balancing on the steep slope of steps, they wrestle the wheels back on track. And get the escalator moving again. The first truss section is, uh, is about halfway down now. A few hiccups at the top, but um, hopefully it's smooth sailing from, from here on to the bottom. Good news, the first escalator truss has reached the bottom. It's very satisfying to see this progress. It's been years in the planning, so uh, very satisfying to see the first section in. But as Tim's team hoist the second piece down into position, they hit another glitch. The second section uh, has come in, and for whatever reason, it's not aligning properly. No, we need it. We don't need these problems right now. Yeah, it's still quite far. I think we will have to take this off. Yeah. The issue we've got is these escalators were, were designed and built uh, over a year ago. Um, between that time and now, we've had to alter uh, this floor level to suit some, some drainage, uh, which has meant that the first and the second truss sections don't align. Guys, will have to jack this section up another few hundred mil. 
and they weigh seven tonne each section, so it's going to be quite difficult to lift them up and do these alterations. This is also going to add some time, uh, some time that we don't have. We managed to get the two sections together. There's a lot of blood, sweat and tears, but happy days, it's in. Now we've got the remaining 11 sections to go in and hopefully we can claw back the lost time. Ten's team now need to push through the night to get the escalator assembly back on track. East at Tottenham Court Road Station. Obviously, we can get access and get this cable out while minus one. Sean and the team are battling to thread a crucial 93 metre long power cable through the maze like station. They've hauled the two ton cable down three floors, but now it's jammed on the corner of the shaft that leads into the station's switch room. Just above the tree, you've only got like that much clearance. And it's just like wedging against everything up here. The team squeeze a roller underneath the cable to help ease it round the corner. Try again. Ah! He's gone. Oh. oh, that's better. Oh. To make up for lost time, Sean rolls up his sleeves to haul with Big Al and the boys from Hartlepool. They're always getting me to do this. Ah! Helping out a little bit, made it a bit easier for him. Oh, I'm out of breath. <laughs> That's it, down here. With the cable end finally in the switch room, it's time to plug it in. To do this, they must slice through the cable's outer casing to expose the inner wires. It's the moment of truth for the team. If they cut the cable too short or any of the 148 wires inside are damaged, they must rip the whole cable out and start again, which could further delay the beginning of passenger services. Hopefully it's been measured perfectly. It isn't, obviously. Cable's coming back out. It's pretty much like a surgical procedure. Can't cut too deep. Obviously, can't cut too shallow. As we bang on, there's absolutely no room for error. It's, it's, it's obviously a very tense moment for me and the lads because this is the biggest cables that we're pulling in. It really has to be right. Yeah, a bit more than truth now. Everything's bang on there. The cut's good, obviously. I'll be completely relaxed until it's in the top of the panel. I know it's long enough. Right, hold. Hup. 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 How's that? How's it going, mate? Going all right, longer up and out. Well, I like we are. That's it. Perfect, mate. Well done. It's gone in like a dream. With the cable firmly in place, they can plug the wires into the switchboard. But they'll only know for sure if their extreme wiring is flawless when they turn on the station's power switch. You sometimes expect a few little mishaps and all that, but the lads have done a blind at a day. Got a few more cables to put away here, and then they're going to be ready for the big switch on. Won't be no bangs, hopefully. At Bond Street, Tim's team have been working night and day to assemble the first 65-metre escalator. The first escalator has been installed, and luckily it fits. It's very satisfying to see the first full complete escalator in. But this is just the initial stage of this colossal installation job. The next step of the process is the slide, which opens up new challenges. 
Tim's team now has two more escalators to squeeze into this steep, narrow passageway. To make space for escalator number two, they need to connect winches to the top and bottom of the first escalator and slide it to one side, inch by inch. But this won't be easy. If they slide one end of the 45-ton escalator faster than the other, the extreme stress could bend or break its frame. And the key to the successful slide is making sure everyone's on the same page, the top crew in constant communication with the bottom crew, making sure that we're sliding in unison. Are you ready? All good, boss, all good. We're about to start now. One, two, three. As the escalator inches to one side... It's not straight. Stop, 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 stop. It veers off course. You've cleared the bottom track. It's like the top hasn't moved. The issue we've got is the, the top's not sliding as fast as the bottom. So the risk there is the escalator can twist and it can also catch on the top or the bottom concrete walls. But the escalator is 65 metres long and, and we're dealing with millimetre clearances, literally one to two mil uh, here and there, so it is very tight. The pressure is on the team at the top to haul this 45-tonne giant back into line. We've had the, the bottom team stop their winching, while the top team winch a couple of extra notches and, and catch up to the bottom team. How's that? A bit more, please, a bit more. Keep going, Dylan. Actually, like that. Yeah, We're back on track now. Straight. Right, OK, we're going again then. One, two, three. With the escalator back on course, the team crank it up a notch. few issues along the way, but uh, all in all, it went quite well. Also, uh, yeah, very happy. It takes Tim's team six days and a painstaking amount of muscle power to slot the remaining two super long escalators into position. But the final piece of this mechanical monster will be the trickiest to fit. It's the hardest piece because it's one of the heaviest and it's a different installation method for this last piece. It's not the longest section, but it is the heaviest section. The last section of the escalators contains all the motors and also the drive shaft or the cog that controls the steps. The process of installing the escalator is probably the same as what they would have done years ago. There's no fancy machinery or anything at all. Winches, hoists, and manpower. We've got literally 10 millimetres of clearance between the previous section of escalator and the concrete wall. So uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be tight. With just millimetres to spare, the team squeeze almost there, almost there. and bolt the last section into position. Beautiful. 
Good job. Very rewarding to see the last section going. It takes Tim's team a further 12 weeks to install all of the escalator's 771 steps. Bond Street Station may now be closer to completion, but with the flooring, ticket halls and train platforms still unfinished, it remains a long way from being able to welcome its first commuters. Across London, teams are working on borrowed time to finish fitting out the Elizabeth Line stations. It's starting to look increasingly difficult to hit the new opening deadline of autumn 2019. In the tunnels, technicians are battling to complete more than 600 train tests through the railway's underground route. Danny O'Connell leads the team from this secure control center. So we have the status of the OHLA, gents, please. We have various systems that we need to test. One key component is the settling. We also test the communications, platform screen doors, power. So it's quite comprehensive, the amount of tests that we need to do. The delay to the railway's opening date has given Danny's team more time to run these tests. But with construction work still a long way off being finished, his team is still limited to just a single 48-hour window every two weeks, where workers must down tools and clear the tracks to allow the test trains through. A 48-hour window every two weeks is a logistical nightmare because these test windows currently are quite short. We need to try to maximise the testing that we do in each test window. Brendan, we just need a confirmation that the routes are going to be set from uh, Abbey to Canary Wharf. These test runs include navigating a single train, east or westbound through the underground tunnels, at low speeds of around five miles per hour, stopping at one station after another. Some test windows we complete in two or four tests. Other test windows, it's maybe 20 to 25. The fundamental system for us is the settling system. 75% of our tests are based around the settling system. With less than a year to go until the railway is due to open in autumn 2019, there are still hundreds more test runs to complete. And these tests will need to gradually increase in complexity. At rush hour, Elizabeth Line operators must be able to smoothly run 24 trains an hour, travelling two and a half minutes apart through the tunnels to shuttle busy commuters between stations. But right now, the team has only been able to run one single train at a time through the tunnels. Danny's team have their work cut out to reach the ambitious deadline. Even though the launch date has been pushed back, the pressure's still on us to deliver this railway. Once up and running, it is predicted that Elizabeth Line trains will transport up to half a million passengers every day. 310 drivers are being recruited for the new line. That's going to help you. You're going to learn through, through other people's experiences as well as your own. Rochelle is 30 weeks into the intensive driver training course. Having passed a series of simulated and real train manoeuvres... Go gently up onto the train and we'll couple up in the train in front of us. Today, she faces her biggest challenge to date taking one of the new Elizabeth Line trains on a special overground run, carrying passengers. I kept waking up a few times in the night. Um, not the best night's sleep. I think it was more nerves than anything else. Starting at Shenfield, Rochelle must guide the train 32 kilometers west on a mainline route that runs into the heart of the city and terminates at Liverpool Street Station there will be up to 1,300 passengers on board, 73 signals, and 16 speed restrictions to navigate. A huge test for Rochelle. I will have passengers on board the train, so that's where the nerves are gonna kick in. Oh, it's a horrible day. Miserable. Please 
this is the train to Liverpool Street. Let's do it. Let's get up to 60. First test, the first station stop. Rochelle must bring the train to a precise halt at a special marker, so all doors of the 160-metre-long train open onto the platform. Give it about 50% now if you want. Just bring it down a little bit and we'll just try and roll. You just see 50. my stop car mark coming up. So let it come to a stand. And then okay. full brakes. And doors on the left. Good first stop. Busy platform. Yeah. Where are they all going? She must keep a close eye on passengers standing near the edge of the platform. Oh, for oh. God's sake. With a scooter as well. And you always get the stragglers and run for it at the last minute. Interlock, yeah. no one there, away we go. This is the train to Liverpool Street. As, you, as it goes on, yeah. you get into it, don't you? Yeah. Just as Rochelle gets comfortable... Stop, Rochelle, let's stop the train. There's a problem up ahead. Lima 410, did you see that? Single yellow? Yeah, and then it's... Into a double yellow. So that's not right, is it? Rochelle must immediately report any unexpected signal to avoid potential train collisions. Hello, signaller. This is a driver of Two Whiskey 75. Um, it's just to report a um, signalling irregularity at Lima 410. The previous was a double yellow, then that was a single yellow, followed by a double yellow. OK, signaller, thank you. Driver out. He said it's already been reported by the previous driver. Okay, that's fine. So it's all clear. With the signal fault cleared... This is the train to Liverpool Street. Rochelle picks up the pace. That's the crossroad tunnel. Off to the left. Yeah. At the moment, we're dodging it. So that's where we'll leave Stratford and we'll go down into the tunnel there, down to Whitechapel, stations beyond. Platform 15. 15. So we need to be under 10 mile an hour, and we've also got a buffer stump, so a couple of things to focus on. Well done. That is brilliant. Do you all right? Doors on the right. Rochelle successfully completes her first passenger service. Enjoy it? I did, yeah. yeah. You've done really well. You grew as the journey went on. Should we go and uh, complete our paperwork and then yeah. go to the office? Yeah. Rochelle must now conquer over 170 more hours of training runs like this to stand a chance of becoming one of the first drivers on the new Elizabeth Line when passenger services finally begin. West at Paddington, starting to look a bit like a canopy. It's taken Cynthia's team 10 weeks to assemble the intricate 4,000 steel pieces that make up the frame of the Elizabeth Line's new station canopy roof. No, it's OK, stop. It's OK. Is it looking all right? Now they face an even more precarious challenge. It's a very exciting day here on site. We're just hoping that the wind doesn't pick up too much, so we'll be able to lift the glass in. Cynthia's team must now carefully install 220 panes of bespoke glass into the steel frame. Each triple glazed sheet weighs a tonne and costs around £5,000. The team must use a suction powered vacuum lifter to hoist every pane into position. They need perfect weather conditions for this plan to succeed. A drop of rain will cause suction to fail, while a gust of wind will toss the pane around like a kite. They must watch each sheet of glass like hawks to stand a chance of installing them all without a hitch, so this station can open on time. To make the task even more demanding, the team must fit each pane in exactly the right position so that the completed glass jigsaw reveals a cloud-inspired image 
one of London's largest ever pieces of art. Every piece of glass is unique because of the artwork that's printed on them. So you could say it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. They all need to be installed in the right order, in the right place. If one was to break, we'd have to order that specific glass again and then obviously wait a number of weeks for it. Let's hope we get some good weather. Just as they prepare to lift the first sheet into place... Oh, man, it's definitely picked up. High winds hold work. No, there's no way they can control that glass and that. Ian, do you know if the wind's OK or not? Um, one minute we're getting uh, 18 kilometres an hour, next yeah. minute it's 32, so it's up and down, up and down at the moment. Oh, OK. But it's still OK. It's not blowing over constantly, so <laughs> yeah. I'm not writing it off yet. Sensing a slight lull in the wind... OK, guys. ..the team sees the moment. OK. Hoist up a bit, nice and easy. They rotate the panel horizontally to reduce the surface area that could be caught by gusts. It takes formidable hand-eye coordination to keep the glass steady in the wind. Which way is it going? Keep coming down, man. Eh? Uh, Keep it coming down. Finish what? Come down! Oh! Keep coming. Keep it coming. Feel more. OK? Good job. Good job. First piece of glass is now in place, so, yeah. Smiles all around now. <laughs> There's 220 panes of glass altogether, so we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Why, right, fellas? Over the following weeks. It's looking good. Okay, hold the height up now, hold the height. Cynthia's team wage a relentless battle against the elements. But very close to the scaffold level. <coughs> to install the remaining panels in Paddington's great glass canopy. It's looking good, buddy. It's looking good. You can just start seeing the um, corner of the canopy just um, peeking out over there. It is very exciting. Looks so much bigger than it does on <laughs> drawings. I think people's first impressions are going to be wow and be really impressed with their sheer size. I'm definitely going to make everyone I know come and visit this and <laughs> have a look at the um, canopy. Two stops east at Tottenham Court Road. It's a critical moment for Li Ling and Sean as they prepare to switch on the station's permanent power source for the very first time. Permanent power comes with a whole network behind it. If one power supply fails, you've got a backup supply. The whole thing has been set up so that the Elizabeth line should never be without power and can always operate safely. Big day today, because um, we're going to be bringing the station to life. It's a culmination of all the work that's been put in by all the electricians. This station will consume enough electricity to power a small town. The team must perform vital safety checks before the big switch on. We've done the protection settings on that side. Right, OK, so proceed with switching on. It's going to remove the isolation, safety lock. Winding this panel into the switchboard plugs the whole station into the 400 volt power supply. It's like a plug at home. It's on a much, much grander scale. Now for the moment of truth. 
Switch in now. For Sean and the Tottenham Court Road electricians, Three. four years' hard work Two. comes down to the press of a button. One. Voltage on all three phases, normal. Oh, mate, you nailed it. <laughs> oh, I was nervous. <laughs> yeah, I'm extremely happy. Not just happy for myself, happy for the whole team. All good. All good, done deal. Happy days. Yeah. This is a huge milestone to know that we're now using the Elizabeth Line's permanent power, and it's another significant step towards finishing. But it's like running a massive race. We can see the finishing posts, but there's a lot to do before we get to the end. Power may now be surging through Tottenham Court Road, but on the day that the railway stations were originally scheduled to open to the public, and passenger train services were due to begin, work on the railway is still far from complete. Fit-out work on all 10 stations is not yet finished, and multiple test trains are yet to run simultaneously at high speed through the railway's tunnels. So these bandits are they're trying to take the westbound up. Crossrail announced that they are unlikely to complete the railway in time for its already delayed opening in autumn 2019. The deadline is deemed overambitious. They need even more time to finish construction and fully complete testing the trains on the line before the railway can safely open. We need to establish radio comms. If we don't get radio comms, we're going to have to rethink. Over. It's another huge blow for London's commuters. Yes, I was very disappointed because it's been going on for such a long time and any delay just prolongs the agony. The protracted delays are expected to add up to a further £2 billion to the £15 billion project. And it could take until 2020 to complete the railway. The extent, both of the time and cost, are pretty jaw-dropping. It's again, it's been a delay, it's again, more money is being spent, and that's really unacceptable. There's a lot of work to do before the now £17 billion railway can carry its first passengers. And the reputations of the engineers building it can be restored. In terms of construction, we are probably more than 95% complete. But the last 5% is so much more complicated than the first 5%. This is a mega project tunneling through London uh, for the first time in 20 years. It's a, a massive accomplishment, but the pressure's still on us to deliver. It's about restoring pride for British engineering and getting this railway open to the British public. Do you want to find out more about engineering and the role of the engineer in urban infrastructure? Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash crossrail and follow the links to the Open University. Ten o'clock comedy on BBC Two. Juicy facts about Jules, insert name here next. Whilst over on BBC Four, dementia brings painful memories to the fore in a moving monologue. Lenny Henry stars in Soon Gone, a Windrush Chronicle.